Um, okay, um, this is slightly a lie. Um, no, it's, it's mostly correct. Um, oops, except there's a spelling error, my nemesis. So um, just a few things I want to, like, I'm going to mention this in the announcements. But all right, so today we're going to, like, soft start for generative models, which is to say that we're not, we're not actually going to um, get too deep into, into them just yet. That's mostly going to occur um, after the, um, the presentations. This is going right, yeah. But um, I, I'm going to do like a, in the second half today, kind of just begin to give you a little bit knowledge about like just, just getting our feet wet into generative models and then we'll kind of get into the heavy stuff next, not next week, but the week after. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this whole PCA thing. The thing that I actually want to do with the first half of today is flip things around and actually do a tutorial first uh, because it, it's more in line with what we were doing last week. And we didn't get a chance to uh, cover how to set up a remote server. So that's actually what I'm going to do today. Um, you don't need necessarily a remote server for everything that you do, but it's kind of a nice thing. And I'll basically take you from, from uh, we're going to use Paperspace as our remote server. Um, and I'll tell you what that is in a second. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I'll basically show you how to set up, um, how to basically run a command line utility to do something cool. And the thing that we're going to show you how to do is style transfer, which is always like a really nice way to begin uh, doing cool things at the command line. It's a really easy to program to use. And um, and then this data set collection tools will probably go into next week. Um, after we do a tutorial, we should have enough time to um, to for me to sort of give you the, to just introduce what generative models are, and then we'll get more deep into them after uh, next week's presentations. So yeah, that's what I'm saying with here, generative model zero theory, and then we'll talk about PCA, which is the simplest possible generative model. I mean, PCA is not really for generative models, but but you can use it as such because it's kind of fun. And um, and then we'll do this paper space style net tutorial. And then um, next week we don't have class. There's You guys don't have Tuesday classes, so it's going to be a Monday schedule on Tuesday. And um, I have this in the... Yes, so, so I've already mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I'm gonna be out of town from literally the minute this, this class is over, I'm going straight to the airport. My flight is at nine. I'm going to Japan, so that'll be really fun. Yay, yay. And then, I kid you not, as soon as I get off the plane to Japan, I'm going to give a talk. I'm like going somewhere to give a talk. So it's really? like wow. class to plane to Japan to talk. So even for me, that's like really, that's a little too much, but it's just kind of, sort of like how the only way I can figure out how to do this without canceling class. So it's kind of um, now the that doesn't mean I'm going to be gone. Like I'm actually um, I really only have like two days of work in Japan. And then after that, I'm just going to kind of amuse myself. So I'll be around by email and stuff. And you guys can um, because in lieu of office hours, like I may have to feel free like to um, I'll be checking my email. Um, it's going to be hard to connect remotely because we're going to have a horrible time difference. But um but definitely like we'll we'll do a case by case basis if people have like burning questions um on uh the stuff for the presentations um i'm also going to be basically flying directly to the to our presentations from from not from japan from china but um but basically like yeah it's back to back just kind of like saturate the time between our two classes so that means that I uh, I won't be here between now and your presentation. Basically, that's a very long way of saying that. However, um, there's going to be some cool stuff for you to look forward to that is actually very relevant to the class. So by popular demand, you guys mainly, we will do these next two AI lab sessions at 6 p.m. Um, so that in theory, all of you can make it if you'd like. And, and then probably after that, maybe I'll just keep it that way. We'll just kind of see how it goes. Uh, but I'm going to have, uh, there will be two substitutes. Um, look out for the announcement that should be coming out on Thursday or so. But basically on this Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, in the conference room, not in room uh, wherever it was before, room 410 or something, or 413. This is 410, I think. Um, Dan Oved, um, you, uh, who is a resident here and a former, and a former student, he's going to do a tutorial on HPC, that's NYU's... Um, High performance compute cluster. Uh, it's really, really, you know, really. Uh, that 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 should be really, really helpful. So the the idea with HPC is that HPC will be able to train things that you won't be able to do 
definitely you won't be able to do on your laptop. And, and, and even on paper space, so, I mean, uh, HPC can give you, for example, multiple GPUs. So one of the things that we'll show how to do when we get into GANs is how to run some of the, how to run some of the utilities that, that, that are like require a ton of GPU. Um, this will be the first year that I actually try to get students to train um, StyleGAN. Um, I mean, of course, it's only like been one year since StyleGAN existed, roughly. But uh, but the last last year I didn't even try because basically StyleGAN uh, requires like at least four GPUs, and um, it's just it's just massive. And I don't know, like it might it might actually still be too much to ask everyone to to run to run that. But um, I don't know. We'll we'll kind of see how 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 we're feeling. But anyway, it, then we'll do a, a tutorial on HPC, which is really like. Um, you should uh, try to register for HPC be before then. That will be actually really useful. And for those of you who want to get ahead on that, um, if you look for Chris Valenzuela's um, GitHub, so just look GitHub Chris Valenzuela, your former cohort here at C Valenzuela. Um, there you go. He actually, ha uh, when he was here, he did a tutorial right here, HPC which um, is just a cheat sheet basically on like how to do stuff on on um, on HPC. And so that, that's actually kind of useful. And actually the first thing is here how to get an account. So if you click here, follow the steps and basically the way it works is I think Shiftman approves all of the HPC requests. So I have an HPC account, I use it and I abuse it. Um, and um, Dan will show you like like if you get approved beforehand, then then maybe you can follow along with Dan. Um, you just have to bug Shipman about it. All he has to do is press a button. So um, so if you all do it at the same time, then he can just go one by one by one, um, click the buttons. And um, HPC is a little bit weird. You know, it takes a little while to get used to some of the extra things that you don't have to deal with when you're just running a remote VM. But it's not too bad. And um, I'm still learning new things. He's actually going to show how to run a node server from there, which I didn't even realize you could do. Um, so actually, someone should show me how to do that because that's kind of cool. And then also, um, uh, what is it? Yeah, well, well, yeah, that, that's going to be just like really great if you want to train some deep, deep neural networks. And then uh, the week after, on the 18th, Ellen Nichols is going to be here, who's also a research resident. Or actually, I guess she's a sir. Oh no, she's a research resident. And um, Ellen is gonna do, she's already done one of these. Uh, she did a runway tutorial, like an introduction to runway. And she's gonna do a, uh, basically a second, a follow up on that on uh, next Friday. And then the Friday after that, I'll be back and we'll figure something else on that. Um, okay, so I think, uh, and then just looking forward, like after our mini presentations, we'll have basically two or th probably two maybe even three weeks on on generative models and generative models will be like GANs and autoencoders and then also things like picks to picks and like uh, you know sort of image to image uh, stuff and then um, that's going to be like the like a big unit by itself and then after that the last few weeks we'll, we'll kind of like get a little looser and then maybe just bring in some like m more like um, you know one-off topics so things that are not necessarily connected to the other stuff that we've done, but are interesting in their own right. Um, we'll probably talk about RNNs and, and language modeling and, and stuff like that. Also, maybe some audio and reinforcement learning. And um, then your your final projects will be week 12. Um, yeah. Any questions on that? Is there a specific, and I remember you talked about it, but I still want to ask again, for the midterm presentation, do you want us to do a presentation or just show the project? Whatever we've done. Yeah, uh, let me, why don't I just go, I had it as the last slide here, but let's just go like, um, this is like the thing I've showed. So basically like, um, I don't really have any like really hard and fast requirements, really mainly like, uh, I want to show you that you want, want to see that you pursued something that you find interesting and, and um, maybe based on one of the things that we showed in class, like in the last few weeks and you know, you have three to five minutes to, to show it and doesn't have to be super polished like you know we're all in the same boat here like we're very prototype friendly and and as I said also like presenting in class is optional and actually I encourage uh, you um, like the if let's say half of you decided you'd rather just show it to me um, in person that like during office hours or something like that which maybe we can push to the next week um, which, 
well, that's that maybe then then you have an incentive not to do it one time. <laughs> um, so maybe I don't know. Let me think about that. But but the point is that if you wanted to show it to me, yeah, how did that work exactly? Well, anyway, if you wanted to show it to me, we'll figure something out. If you wanted to show it to me personally. Um, that'll actually save us time in class, and then I'll, I can go faster into generative models. So, so it's definitely like don't um, like it, like that's that's definitely a good option is to show it to me. And these are all the things that um, you know we've looked at so far. But really, you can go off the board and do something else if you want. Um, you know, some people have already kind of started getting into into generative models, and you know, so um, who was it that was looking at the GPT two? Someone. I can't remember actually. Um, hmm? Ah, let's do. The, yeah, I want to see some GPT two uh, in action. Um, yeah. So does that answer your question? Are there any others? Yeah. Okay. So uh, for the mm -hmm. HPC, should we use you as our sponsor? No, I think it has to be Shiftman. I don't think I have. Huh? Oh, really? I have the ability to sponsor. What does that mean exactly? I don't. I didn't. So I don't know how to do it. Okay. So just use Shiftman. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, maybe I get. Maybe I don't know. Someone can try me, and then I'll get an email about it. Maybe I've never. I didn't realize I had that capability. It doesn't really make sense that I would. It, it feels to me like maybe if you try, it'll say that I don't have authorization or something. But I don't know. Who knows. There's, a, there's an option to send an email to the team. To the team? Mm -hmm. What team? Um, <laughs> high performance PCM team. Oh, <laughs> I, that's, that's probably the administrators who, who run it. Okay. So that's like uh, this guy Shenlong and Trigo, some others. Uh, hmm? Trigo for you. <laughs> Yeah. No, they're actually quite helpful. Yeah, they're super helpful. I, I tried to sudo on HPC once. And they got That's, really, they yeah. Got really yeah, yeah, you're not supposed to do it. In fact, if you do, it says something like this will, you will be reported or yeah, something. I, it's I, like, I was, I was reported. it's almost like a trap, you know, because like they could just deactivate sudo and then, you know, whatever. But then it's like, even if you try to use sudo, it'll, it'll like send some report to the administrators. That's really, it's really, it's a little bit of like a, what is it like uh, Kafka esque? <laughs> it's like a they just trap. Leave it dangling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right. Well, anyhow, let's get into the tutorial, and then um, let's hopefully this won't take too long. And uh, this will. I'm gonna do basically a neural style tutorial, more like paper space and neural style, and um, and then we'll have and then we'll take a break, and then we'll have time for. To just start a basic lecture about PCA, and um, yeah, and then actually we will have to end the class slightly early today, maybe by like fifteen minutes, uh, and end at around six, I think, uh, because because my flight's at nine. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, well, um, well, let's get started. Okay. Um, getting so remember we talked about how you know we're we're gonna start to show some of these deep learning frameworks and we're not actually gonna use them uh, we're not actually gonna code with them in this class that's beyond the scope of this class although it's definitely very relevant we're just gonna use them mostly from a command line tutorial uh, from the command line uh, but it's worth noting that these things that we're using they are um, you know they they really like okay well we're using um, actually we're not using TensorFlow today we're using Torch. But basically, you know, this, the idea is that these are all really heavy lifting uh, frameworks that have been optimized for deep learning. And, um, you know, there's, there's various ways of interfacing with them. There's a lot to them. And, and you know, you, none of us are going to, um, including me, are, are going to master them in this, in this class. But, um, but we do have access to them, which is really great. You know, we can actually run the same things that the top scientists do. And that didn't used to be true. It used to be that a lot of that stuff was super proprietary, but open source software has largely has largely won. And so, you know, we're kind of in the situation where we all have access to the same tools, but we don't have access to the same data. So that's actually the new divide is that um, you actually need really a lot of data to do some of these things. Fortunately, the things that I'll show you today, you don't need much data at all. Um, 
Okay, now the thing that I'm going to show you is how to run style transfer. And this is actually like um, style transfer was um, one of the first uh, one of the first techniques from to emerge from deep learning that really really captured the attention of media people like media artists and and designers and creatives because it was like this overtly artistic application and um, the funny thing about style transfer is that it it really sort of emerges kind of from the same research that uh, ended up uh, producing deep dream and as I said last week when we talked about deep dream um, that comes out of research that was that was really concerned with doing things like visualizing the uh, visualizing and understanding neural networks and so a lot of this stuff sort of came to become art but kind of by accident like inadvertently um, so so and, and actually like it, it, for those of you who, who have been following this field you might also be aware of things like um, uh, what is it um, adversarial learning so like ad, uh, like trying to fool neural networks with adversarial examples um, this is something that maybe we'll maybe we'll casually mention like later in the class as a special topic uh, but the cool thing about that is that it's the same. It's basically the same thing as Deep Dream, or roughly speaking, and um, and then really like style transfer is actually even though it seems like it's such a different thing, um, it actually is is with a few changes pretty much the same technique. Um, at least the original style transfer, and this has kind of changed a little bit because style transfer now means really anything that you know corresponds to one image being styled into another, so like pix to pix. But the original style transfer really comes from that research, and, I'll, and that's what I'll show you is used today. And so this will be the repository that we use. So you can, if you look up, neur, if you Google neural dash style, you'll find it. Um, it's by Justin Johnson. It's on GitHub. And um, we're going to, now you can run this anywhere. Um, you can even run it on your own laptop, actually, without the use of GPU. It's just, the only thing is that if you try to run it on your laptop, it'll take like, like, probably like three hours to produce one image, something like that. Um, and uh, with the G because you won't be able to use the GPU, but with the GPU, you'll, uh, you can produce an image in a few minutes, five, 10 minutes. And um, so this repository can be run on any, on any computer that supports it, um, including HPC for that matter. And, uh, but what we'll, we'll do is actually, we'll show you how to use it on Paperspace, which is a remote VM, a remote server, be, uh, for one reason, um, normally I would do this in Runway, but Runway actually doesn't have neural style yet. It's something that I want to actually wrap to Runway, so uh, we won't use, we won't do this in Runway, but um, uh, but we'll we'll do it in Paperspace. And Paperspace is kind of useful also because Paperspace is kind of the easiest way to launch a computer in the cloud that has the specs that you need to do machine learning stuff, um, and uh, you know, without paying too much money. So, so it's the same thing. It's like like Runway. You pay per moment of time that you use it. If you use a paper space computer for, for with a GPU for one hour, it costs like fifty cents. So, um, nothing to break the bank. Now, I wouldn't train StyleGAN on it because then you're gonna then it's gonna cost like in the hundreds or maybe thousands of dollars. Um, it really adds up. But to do style transfer, it costs like fifty cents. Um, so. Um, now, I, I'm not expecting anyone to actually sign up for an account. You don't have to. This is optional. The whole point of this isn't necessarily to show, is not necessarily to get you up and running on Paperspace, just to see what you could do. And like I said, I'm recording this, so if you if you don't have an account in Paperspace, I'd rather you not sign up for it right now. You can just watch it and then grab the video later and then follow the steps. Um, and uh, for those who do have an account in Paperspace, you can actually do this now if you want, But but again, you don't have to. Um, yeah, I think. And so the nice thing about paper space is that I'll show you how to do neural style, but you could do other things in paper space as well. So, so it's just kind of a nice skill to have. And also it's a general skill because anytime you have access to a remote computer, which can come in many forms, uh, HPC, for example, you're going to be practicing your remote server, you know, manipulation techniques. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, yeah, and then that's this slide actually begins generative models. So I'm gonna actually get out of here, and we'll we'll start the tutorial. So, first of all, what the hell is paper space? 
So if you go to, if you were to use this and you check out paper space, you'll see that paper space is this basically a, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, well, it's a very modern website that, that's, um, that's giving you access to remote computers that you, that you can rent in the cloud. And um, paper space is, you might say it is to Amazon cloud services or Google cloud. It is to that as Apple is to Microsoft, let's say. So like Microsoft back in the day makes highly scalable software for companies and enterprises. And then Apple made computers for individual users. That was kind of the Microsoft versus Apple thing, you know, enterprise versus user, you know. And so this is kind of the same thing. Paper space makes it because Amazon Cloud is really for 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 companies that are running that need to scale their computation because they're running some server um, and, you know, they don't have their own hardware. So there, uh, if you look at Amazon Cloud, that stuff is, re it's like a lot of like, it's like, it's like taking a submarine across a pool, you know, something like that. That's what, that's what it would be like to, to use Amazon to do what we're going to show. Like it's, it's just a lot more uh, than you need. And then paper space is like the bare minimum that you need for one user to launch one computer in the cloud. Something, something like that is a decent analogy. And um, like paper space does cost money. Like I said, it's like, but it's, it's pretty manageable. So it's like something like, you know, for the GPU is 50 cents an hour. For the nicer GPUs, it might be a few dollars even, but we can get away with the, with the cheap ones. And also uh, it does cost storage. So if you keep a computer, it's like $5 a month. You can always terminate the computer. So you don't have to pay the, but, it, but for storage, it's like five bucks a month or something like that. Um, now the way that once you're in, once you have a paper space account, you would have this console and here, the first thing here is that you have you, you're in the core, you have machines and, um, I actually have one machine that I prepared for today, which I'm going to use, but I'm actually, um, I'm going to take you through the process of creating a new machine as well. So you get everything from scratch. Um, the reason why I have this is because I'm going to do the old switcheroo um, instead of waiting for the other thing to set up. I'll, I'll just go to this one, which has already been set up. So for now, I'm just going to launch this. So like this is an existing computer. You can go click restart and, and that is going to just turn it on for me. But we'll, we'll ignore that for a moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get, create a new machine. So this is roughly what you would need to do to create an instance that lets you run neural style. So you click new machine and then it goes, okay, choose a region and okay, just, you know, East coast is fine. And then choose an OS, right? Choose what is your base operating system. And, um, you have a few options. You have these windows and Linux templates. Um, I'm not, I'm going to use a Linux template, but I'm actually not going to use the, the base Linux template, but I'm actually going to go into these public templates. And then the public templates are a few custom templates they have, which come from different places that have some of the base layer software already installed. And um, the ML in the box, although it's slightly broken and I'll take, tell you why in a moment, um, this actually has most of what we need to kind of start from scratch. So I'm going to select this ML in the box and then you can choose the machine. You can pay for it either monthly or hourly. So monthly, as you might imagine, is cheap, like is cheaper in a month than running the hourly thing all month. But of course, like that's only necessary. It, it, the monthly thing is kind of like almost not worth it, I think, because it's a lot of money for a month, 300 bucks for a month, you know, you, so one year of that, you could buy, um, you could buy a really good computer. So, so it's not super, it's not super useful. So we'll do the hourly. And then we'll just pick the first one, the GPU plus 51 cents per hour. The storage, we can just keep it the minimum 50 gigabytes. So it goes $5 a month and then it's prorated. So if you keep it for half a month, it'll just charge you two and a half dollars. And so if you keep it for just a few hours, then you'll just get charged, you know, whatever it is, 50 cents or something like that. So you can really actually, um, just for the sake of a tutorial, you can spend nothing more than a dollar, $2. Um, so, so it's not so bad. 
Um, then the machine details, you can give it a name if you want instead of new machine. Let's call it, um, let's call it, uh, you know, ITP. And um, this is if you have teams, you can assign them to users, but I, or you can just leave it as this. And then the one, uh, the, the rest you can leave the same except one thing here, public IP. Public IP will give you an IP address, will give that machine an IP address that you can remotely connect to. If you don't have a public IP, the only way to interface with the machine is directly through the website. Uh, but we wanna actually interface with it different, differently. So I'll do this public IP. And then you would have your payment options, there's a credit card in there, and um, create your paper space. So now what it's gonna do is it's beginning to provision this machine, which means it's actually like, you know, creating, it's a virtual machine, so it's creating it on its own infrastructure. And what'll happen is when it's done creating, it will send you an email that has a temporary, that has the IP address and the temporary password. And uh, I'll show you how to get into the machine. Um, while it's doing that, I'll show you like with the machine that I already have on. I'll show you really quickly. Like if you if you uh, don't click on the gear icon, just click directly into the you know this icon. It'll take you to the um, to basically like you're looking at the desktop of that computer. So you're looking. This is now a Linux machine you know, on paper spaces servers, you have a browser in there, right? I can click the browser. And then here's my browser in the browser. Now it's important to just like be aware that this is, you're literally, it's like, look, what? <laughs> okay. So I almost never use the desktop and I'll tell you why in a second, but um, because like this, it's like really like, like a mouse controlling another mouse, you know, it's very meta and it's, it's just, it's actually like, it's sending you all of the pixels of this whole computer screen, you know, so it's, it's kind of slow and it's clunky and you know, it's not really the best way, but you do have it available if you want. Right. Um, and actually there's one thing that we will do, uh, which will actually be kind of useful, um, which I'll show you in a second. Um, yeah. Okay. So basically, this is this is the console so you have access to that computer if you want it that way you know you can run a terminal for example if you click here you yeah this is really why it's not worth doing this um so let me go back and um if you click on the gear icon you'll see that you can also open a terminal um now you so it has a virtual terminal inside here that lets you access to the machine and yeah so you know you put in your password and you know then you have and we we did this before we've already seen a little bit of terminal stuff we had our terminal velocity session um, for those of you who who saw that right so this is a normal terminal but again like i'd rather term i'd rather do it externally because it's a little clunky doing it through the web basically um okay now going to the machines we see that this itp a fresh ML in the box has been created. So if I click on the gear icon, it shows me the IP address. That's right here, which I can copy. And it will have sent me an email. Um, uh, it will have sent an email to my computer with the password. So uh, I'm going to show you the process of doing that. Now, because I'm recording this, I'm just gonna pause this before I very quickly show you my email. Machine is right here. It gives you the SSH info. And you can do, go into a terminal, right? And now I go SSH paper space at <laughs> the IP address of that machine. It'll go the authenticity, blah, 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 can't be established. You go yes. Uh, and then it asks you for your password. And then the password is here. It just give us, gives it to you right here. Your temporary password is this. So I just paste it in. Note, by the way, when you type in here, it doesn't show encrypted characters, so it's a little confusing. It, it's in the terminal, it just remains blank. So don't be worried that you're not actually typing. So you can actually paste and then it doesn't look like anything happened, but it did. And then I like to change the password as soon as I get it to something that's not a bunch of random characters. And the way to change the password is to do sudo. Uh, sudo means administrator. You're the administrator of this computer. Pass wd. So that's 
You guys all see that, right? Uh, paper space, which is the name of the user. And then it'll ask you to put in a new password and I'll put in one like ITP ML4A. Then retype it, ITP ML4A. And that's been changed successfully. So, um, so that's that. This is recording, right? Yeah. Um, so, okay, now, now what? Now let's go to, um, so, so, okay, now we're inside the computer, right? Now there's a few things we have to do before we can use, uh, before we can use neural style. Uh, the ML in the box comes with the major, um, the major, I, um, deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. And you can actually check on them. Like if you go open a Python shell, you go import TensorFlow and this should in, in theory work. Yeah. So TensorFlow is there. We can see what version it is. It's t it's 114. There's actually TensorFlow 2 now, which is, uh, but that hasn't been updated, but that's okay. I think it, I think it also has Torch, PyTorch. Yeah. Yeah. So Torch and, uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow are installed. However, um, the, it turns out that the still my favorite um, style transfer repository was made in Torch, not in PyTorch. It was made in the original Torch, which was written in a programming language called Lua. And Torch is rapidly sort of going out of style because PyTorch uh, is much preferred. It's in Python, but no one's made a really awesome neural style repository in Python, in, uh, in Python yet. So I really, really like to use the neural style repository, which is in Torch, the original Torch. And so I'm going to actually show you how to install it because it turns out the Torch doesn't even even come with um, with these ML in the box templates. So, but it's super easy because I have taken everything that you need to do and I put it into a one gigantic script that you can run. So let me show you what you need to do. Basically, if you go to my GitHub gist, so that's going to be gist.github.com slash Gene Kogan. And then you'll see that the last thing that I made, which is five days ago, so if this gets outdated around October 3rd, I made something called paperspacetorch.sh. This is a script, this is a bash script, which installs Torch, installs all of its dependencies, installs neural style, and basically does a bunch of fixing random bugs that are inside the ML in the box um, template. So um, the way to run this is that you can actually run these commands one by one if you want inside of a terminal, right? So you, these are all just terminal commands and, and it will, if you run, if you copy one line at a time and just run them, that will work. Uh, a better way to do it is just run it all inside of a script. Do you have a question? Oh, well, once for each new machine. Yeah. So when you start a new machine, you have to set up all the software. Um, now, uh, so okay, so let's let's actually do that. And uh, what I'm uh, before I do that, let, let we okay. So I want to create this and put it into my machine. So how do I get this file into here? Um, so there's a bunch of ways we could do this. One would be uh, we could actually write it directly in here. Remember, we uh, did we show Vim before? Okay, Vim is really Vim is really weird. So maybe I'm not going to show you Vim. <laughs> but the idea is Vim is that it's a terminal-based te uh, editor, text editor. So if I go like Vim, you know, hello.sh, then I'll create a file called hello.sh, and then I can type things in it like echo, you know, hello everybody. Um, you know, so if I then write it, now I have a file, hello.sh, and I can run it. It goes, hello, everybody, right? I can remove it. But um, a much better way, which will also give us um, an opportunity to show something else that you should be aware of, is to, um, is to uh, do an FTP transfer. So basically to transfer a file. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to open up Cyberduck, which is, if you're on Mac, this is kind of the, the like easiest free FTP client application. Um, so, 
fetch. Fetch. What is fetch? I've got a two D software. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, okay. So then you would change this to SFTP SSH, and then click, and then basically find your um, your IP server here. Username is paper space and then put in your password. I think I said ITP ML 4 a right and then that will connect and So now we have a file system of that computer There it is. So now what I can do is I can uh, for example like um, So here's a, here's a funny way to do it. I'm gonna run this command touch um, We'll create a file called fix.sh so now there's an empty file called fix.sh. So if I go back here and reload this, I can open it now with an editor like TextMate. So here's a blank file. So now I'll go back to here and I'll copy all of this. So I click raw and then just copy it. Put that all in here. And then this, this script is really long because I, like, I wanted to make this basically do everything automatically. <laughs> For you and then I had some some issues doing that but then anyway I uh, press save and then you should see a notification sometimes it doesn't pop up but if you click reload and you see that it's bigger now see 2.8 kilobytes we were able to it like saves it remotely yeah for some reason sometimes the notification doesn't pop up but basically that's there and we can verify that by running cat which will show it to us and there it is so here's what we can do now so this is all all you need to do is basically oh one okay so then um, I think just in case like you may not have to do this but you might have to change the permissions of the file using I think I can tell if it yeah basically if you do chmod plus 755 I know it's really weird it's basically changing the read write execute permissions of the file and this is saying that you may execute the file fix.sh so now the file can be run and so now to run it you would do this dot slash fix.sh and if you run this it will start to do tons of stuff and this whole process takes like 20 minutes literally like and you just go and have a cup of coffee like you can this is why I love like having computers just like when you're training a neural network overnight you feel like you're working while you sleep <laughs> I'm training two of them right now actually this is really um, hopefully three by the end of today um, so now this takes a long time and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to like have you ever watched a cooking show where where um, where you know they put the thing in the oven and then they just like then they just go to a different oven where it's already been prepared. <laughs> so I'm gonna do that now with the other machine, um, which is uh, just go SSH into that instance because it's already working. So let me go back to my new machine. Here's that IP address, and I'll go SSH paper space at this. Okay. So this is the same thing, uh, except everything has already been done. And actually, there's still one more thing that has to be done. Um, so before I go back to this, while this is doing its thing, there's one other thing that's not there yet, which is um, uh, CUDNN, uh, uh, which is um, it's an add-on for NVIDIA, which makes CUDA a little bit more memory efficient than CovNets, basically. And we don't have to know what any of that means, but the point is that and this is this is the most annoying thing because you have to download it from the CUDA uh, NVIDIA developer site. This is optional. Um, you don't actually need to do this to make NeuroStyle work, but NeuroStyle works more memory efficiently if you run it. And if it works more memory efficiently, you can make the images bigger. Uh, otherwise, you run out of memory if you're not using CUDNN. So it's really kind of useful to have. Uh, but fortunately, this is actually easy. It's tedious, but easy. What you do is you would go to... Um, NVIDIA developer site. If you search for NVIDIA developer, you can see um, actually it better even NVIDIA developer CUDNN. CUDNN. 
and you can see NVIDIA CUDNN, NVIDIA developer. If you go here, you have to register for an account with them. I know it's super annoying. I wish I could just distribute the file, but technically it's like, I don't know, even though you get it for free right away, but I don't know, it's just kind of, the point is you register, it's really easy. You know, you just register for a free account with them and then, you know, you would log in and as I'm logging in now, and then what you would do is the paper space ML in the box uh, template, it has CUDA 10. So you go, I agree to terms of use, download CUDNN for CUDA 10. Probably 10.1 works also, but, but we have 10, so I'm just gonna... So you click that and then you would go here and click CUDNN library for Linux. You would click this and it would download the zip file of these files. Now I've already done that and that is actually right here. Um, not right there, that's actually right here. CUDNN, this is the file, it's like 400 megabytes. And so what you would do now is you in, in our file, while in our server, while everything is being made, you would also transfer this here. Okay, so this, for some reason the Wi-Fi in here is really bad today, yeah? I don't know what's going on because this might actually take too long, but that's okay. Like, because we have the one that's already prepared, so that's fine. Um, anyway, while this is transferring, I will uh, go back to the pre. Uh, and, and just so you, just so you know, like the last thing that you'll have to do, you'll see it's written here. You would just have to run these commands from the root folder, and that copies the cudnn file. This is the file that we downloaded, right? So you would go to the, once you've transferred it, you go to that directory in the terminal, you run this, this will unzip it, and then this will copy the files inside of that folder into the CUDA fold, into the CUDA like um, system folders, and then you have CUDNN. So I know it's all super tedious and annoying. You only have to do it once, and then you can just, you can keep your machine around as long as you don't uh, deactivate it. Uh, you can turn it off so you can shut down, which means it won't bill you hourly, It'll just charge you $5 a month to have it. But as long as you have that machine, you don't have to do this again. So, um, you know, that's kind of nice. So, okay, so let's go, while well, see it's doing its thing. I'll go to the, the oven that's ready and I will show you how to use Neural Style. So part of the, that script, it will, it will clone Neural Style into a folder, Neural Style, right? So now I'm in a neural style folder. You can press LS and you can see, let me kill all these other things that I don't need these other PNGs. Um, yeah, so this is what comes with it. And there's a model, there's a pre-trained model in there. Now, what is the pre-trained model for in neural style? Uh, I haven't really, um, well, we, we talked about this last week a little bit, how neural style works. Remember that it, it runs this iterative optimization process, which, updates the pixels uh, slightly, each iteration, um, so as to uh, optimize a particular objective. And that objective is to minimize the content loss and to minimize the style loss. And the way that the content and style loss are computed is by using a neural network that was trained for other things. Basically, this is actually a well-known neural network, VGG, Basically, this was the best neural network in 2013 or something for ImageNet. And uh, we, can, we can just simply use it as a feature extractor to use for calculating these losses. And now none of that, you don't need to understand how any of that works. Like that's just, just so you know, that's, this is what it's being used for. And we have it. This will, it'll download it first and then we have it. Um, now, how do we use neural style? So, um, to use neural style, you would you would run th. Th runs torch, right? So th is torch. That just starts a torch console. I'm going to get out of the console. Um, you don't need to use the console. If you do th neural style dot lua, and then um, I think if you do help, it'll list the commands. If I'm not mistaken, uh, let's see. Yeah. So this will give you a list of all the arguments. Now you can also get a list of all the arguments and also like some discussion of them. If you go to the neural style repository. Um, so that's this. 
So Justin, um, who was the original developer of this, he wrote down some instructions um, that let you understand some of the different parameters. Talks about the style scale parameter, for example, how that works, the style interpolation parameters, how to keep the original colors. This is all like, there's a whole, all, all sorts of features that you can use. Um, and uh, let's see, here's, yeah, here's all the options. So basically, you know, how big is the image that you're making? You know, there, there's tons and you can usually use all the defaults. I'll just show you the ones that I find useful. So, um, so first of all, we need a content image and a style image. So I'm going to take a picture of um, somebody. Who wants to be in our, who doesn't mind being in our video? Should I draft? Yeah. Can I just take a picture in roughly this direction? <laughs> Not everyone's in it, obviously, but you know, but it's okay. Great. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, what's a good way of transferring this to my computer? Um, I will, I want to keep emailing stuff um, to myself. <laughs> huh? No, I have an Android. Um, I'll just email to myself and pause. Hold on a second. So, the, and then also while we're doing that, who has an idea for um, like a, a good style image? You know, maybe your favorite painting or something, some texture. Dolly. Dolly? Yeah. Any others? We can take a vote. What? Oh, Kandinsky. Kandinsky actually works really well, just because like the style is kind of very obvious. Um, okay, hang on a second. Just gonna pause real quick. All right, I'm gonna log into into this is the other one, so I'm gonna log in there. Um, okay, so in the neural style here, I'm going to transfer this image that we took. Here it is, by the way. All right. So let's throw that in there. And um, let's now also pick, so there it is. And let's let's rename it like class.jpg. Or is it a PNG? No, it's JPEG. Class. And let's also like download some something like okay let let's call something out. Basquiat. Perfect. Let's get a bigger version though. Um, or a bigger. What's that? No, but now, now they make people do like small, medium, large. You can't like specify a size as well. Uh, they keep on making it like worse. worse. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab this um, link location. This is another trick I'll show you. If this actually gives me a oh, this might not actually work right. All right, fine. Let's just do it the the old fashioned way. I'm gonna save the image. Um, Basquiat. And oops, and then let's transfer that Basquiat. There it is. Okay, so there we have it. The where am I? Oh, it's not the right. Oh, I got disconnected for some reason. Sometimes you get disconnected. Okay, there, uh, CD narrow style, LS, and there's class.jpg and basquiat.jpg. So let's do the basic thing. I'll do th narrow style.lua, and then basically, once you have CUDNN installed, you always want to use CUDNN. And so, like the first argument, you should just always have this. It won't do it by default, but if you dash backend CUDNN, 
that will give you CUDNN. And it's just better to use objectively all the time. So now we go content uh, image, content underscore image. Oops. So that's going to be class.jpg. And then style underscore image is going to be basquiat.jpg. And then output image, it's, it's just called output by default, but let's just, you know, give it a name, class basquiat.png. And that will specify that it wants to be a PNG. And then the, and then, um, well, let's just leave it at that for a second and just see how that comes out. So now what will happen is it will load, this is what happens. Basically, it loads the neural network that's going to be used to analyze the images and give you the activations tells us what that what the architecture of that neural network is then it calculates the style of the one image that it has and then um, and then it's going to begin to do its thing basically in just a moment so is it is it safe to say that the that running remotely a model on runway is kind of like a much uh, compressed, simplified version of this process using paper space. So like, like in terms of like the fact that all those models on there you can run remotely, it's basically like underneath the skin doing a similar thing to like working through paper space. And yeah, stuff. totally. Yeah, very similar. Mm -hmm. There's just more convenience to it. So, um, it goes in iterations and it'll give us an update every 50. And so it's just giving us the loss and the loss should go down roughly like each time. And you can see how long it'll take, right? It's already one fifth of the way through. And you can actually, it'll, it'll make, it'll show you the progress as it goes. So if we go to the example here, you'll see that it has this like, it goes, here's what it looks like after a hundred iterations. not super there yet because a hundred iterations it starts at random noise and then it be, which it doesn't have to that's that's actually an option that you can change um, but if you start at random noise it basically look you know it kind of starts something like this and if we see where it is now so after 300 iterations now it's already getting there now first of all notice that the size of it is it's by default, it will make it 512 pixels at its biggest dimension. This is one of the flags that you can change. Now, we want to make something bigger, right? That would be kind of nice. Um, now, how big can we make it? So, well, I'm going to quit this process. It's already at 450, but let's just, let's just kill it. And then I just want to make sure that I don't leave a zombie process. You could always do that by checking in video SMI. Nothing there. Good. So I'm going to rerun the same command. But now I'm going to add another argument to it. Image underscore size. Now, how big can we make it? Now, here's the here's the thing with neural style. The bigger that you make the output image size, the more activations it has to keep in memory in the in the video memory. And basically, there's a natural limitation to this. Now, um, and, and now it depends on the total number of pixels. So it says image size is going to be the number of pixels on its longest side. Um, so depending on the aspect ratio, this will change what the total number of pixels is. Um, I find that for a normal sort of landscape image, um, you, you, can, you can just about maybe uh, with, with CUDNN, you can, on one GPU, you can roughly get to like 1300 or so, which is pretty big. So let's do that. Um, I, and then this, we'll see if it runs out of memory, it'll just crash and then we can make it smaller. But I think, um, maybe even like 1340 or something like that. I I've, I've like tweaked this a, enough times to have a good, uh, number. Yeah. Is that a pixel number or a pixel? Pixels, pixels. Yeah. Number of pixels. Yeah. Oh, Not total pictures. The, well, uh, usually width, if it's landscape, um, height, if it's portrait, it's the longest dimension. Okay. Out of memory. See? Okay, so let's try 1300. Maybe we'll get lucky. We'll try to just max it, max it out if we can. Yeah. Okay, cross your fingers. 
running optimization so far so good I think we just I think yeah it seems like 1300 roughly maybe 1320 um, you know something like that now for okay so here's the the upside and the downside the upside is it's bigger that's great that we want to make bigger right um, the downside is that it takes longer so 1300 means it's it's bigger than uh, the the on the width it's bigger by 2.5 times and on the height which means actually really that um, that it takes this long because it's this many more pixels so it'll take six times longer to make something at 1300 pixels versus 512 so this is going to take a little much longer than it was taken before but you know it'll take enough time that we can actually like um, see some something in progress and actually we'll do something really cool over the break and then see how that turns out um, now the next thing to show is um, let's see is uh, well let's let's have a discussion of the parameters while we're while we're waiting for it to do its thing so there's other things that you can work with uh, the ones that I most often work with are the following um, well, I'll, I'll go over them in, in order and then I'll talk about each one, you know, to the extent that they're important for you to know. Uh, but basically, uh, okay, let's see. So the ones you definitely need are, are always content image and style image, you know, at, at a minimum. Otherwise, it'll just use one of the examples. And output image if you want to give it a name. Otherwise, it'll just call it output.png. And so if you keep it doing that, it'll keep overwriting whatever you were doing before. Image size, as we mentioned, this is the size of the image. By default, it's 512. And, you know, if you want to make it bigger, you can max it out. Uh, if it's a landscape image, roughly 1300, maybe 1200, depending on the aspect ratio. Um, style blend weights. Now, um, this is something we haven't talked about enough, but like the way that the style loss is, is uh, evaluated is at a per layer, per layer uh, style loss. And so there's a default way of, of uh, averaging those, basically like a weighted average. Huh? What does that mean per layer? So there's a, there's a uh, yeah, there's a, um, so the style loss is calculated from the activation maps. So well, which activation maps, right? And the way you could do it from all of them, and, you know, that's, that's what it does, but it weights them differently. So it like finds that they found that it's better to um, weight more certain layers, you know, somewhere in the middle, because that seems to do a better job perceptually. Um, you can modify this if you want, but almost probably you won't need to. Like if you start messing with this, you're getting into some, some, you know, finer, sort of more specific territory. Um, but you don't need to worry about that too much. Now the content weight and style weight is really interesting. So remember that there are two loss terms. There's a style loss and there's a content loss. And um, the content weight and the style weight, which are by default uh, basically five and one, and, and really what, what matters is the ratio between them. The, that's the important thing. So here the content weight is five times bigger than the style weight. Um, now, and that produces the canonical results that we kind of see. If you make the... Um, style weight let's say um, bigger much bigger then the result will um, prioritize style reconstruction more and so like instead if the ratio wasn't five but instead was one let's say then um, what you would find is that the result uh, maybe does a better job capturing the style of the style image but you start to lose some of the content now to take this to an extreme if you made the content weight zero, then the content weight does not matter anymore in the calculation of the loss. It's all the same. It's just multiplied by zero. So what happens is that the thing does not try to reproduce the content at all. It just, it just tries to create something that has the style of the style image. So this is kind of what that whole texture synthesis was, was going for. So when I showed you, for example, this Hokusai, um, speaking of Japan, um, one, this thing that I showed you maybe last week that basically does like uh, th this. This is basically just running style transfer, uh, the style transfer with the Hokusai as the style image, 
the content image is not important, it's just something random, and then the content weight is zero. So it's just making sort of stuff that looks like Hokusai. Um, Hokusai, of course, is this. Right, so just so you know, so you know, um, and so that's that's kind of that's a cool thing to do, and that's maybe what we'll try to do over the um, over the the break. I'll I'll try to run some cool you know style. Uh, yeah. Yep. Well, it still takes it. It just doesn't care to reconstruct it. So it could be anything. It does, however, just the way the neural style works, it makes the output size, uh, the output image, to match the content image in uh, like like the size. Not, not in the si uh, size, but in aspect ratio. So the content image does at least play a role in figuring out how big the canvas is. Uh, because, because remember, like it's ultimately, it's supposed to match the content image. Like remember the Mona Lisa, right? And so it makes sense that it would calculate the aspect ratio from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, something would happen, like, it, uh, but it, it would just look like a weirdly distorted version of the content of the you know, original image, basically. It's not as interesting as it sounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, now, another thing is this init. Init says, what is the original image, the original output image, right? Because the output image, like, we're iteratively changing the pixels until it produces the output. Well, iteratively changing them from what? Um, what is the first image, right? So by default, it does uh, random, which means it just starts with random noise. You could change it instead to be um, uh, to be to be uh, initialized from another image, and most commonly, the other image is just the content image. So you could use the content image as the init image. Um, and that does a, that's kind of nice because then you might, that's another way of trying to get more of the original content in the output image. So, so you can play with that. Or another idea is to, is to start with a, a different image, like a third image entirely. Um, there's a lot of things you could take with it. Uh, now, for example, for me, when I showed you this Hokusai thing, I was using the init image in a very special way. So the idea was, okay, this was the first frame that I produced. And then for the second frame, I would take this image that I produced the first frame, I would slightly distort it somehow, like rotate it, for example, and then I would make that the init image for the second run. Um, so then I would start with this image and then, and then synthesize on top of it. And uh, the reason why this works is then, then you, this is why you get c continuity, right, instead of just random all the time. Uh, because it because using the init image is a way of sort of guiding it a little bit, um, or you know possibly in a very heavy way. Yeah. Minimum to do what? The the content weight um, is it oh, does not. Uh, control that. So the content weight is used to try to reconstruct the content of the content image. The init image is what you start with. So for example, like if we if we looked at this, remember that in the class Basquiat, like it doesn't actually it doesn't actually show us the first image. It shows this after a hundred iterations. But this is what it looked like starting from random noise. Oh, that's two hundred. Um, the first one is actually just like random sort of pixels, but instead we could have used, I'll, I'll show it to you in a second, actually. Why don't I just do that in the moment? I'll just show, as soon as this is finished, we'll do like a quick run, which uses an init image. So for example, like I'll use one of these examples. Uh, we'll do like the, something that's in the same, uh, maybe something that's, yeah, we'll start with, the problem is they're all the wrong size, but but maybe that's okay. Like I'll 
because I feel like maybe it'll be annoyed at me if I use different sized images. They're all vertical. Um, yeah. Um, so, first of all, this is five hours left. What's the deal with the internet today? Oh, it's okay. So we don't need this because I have my instance. So I'm just going to stop this. Um, so we'll... This is all messed up today. <laughs> um but let's see this this should how are we doing on this yeah still 300 350 so you can see that it takes quite a while um to to do a thousand iterations it uh, so we'll we'll kind of um yeah we'll we'll let it go and then maybe um we'll look at it and then we'll take a break and we'll start uh one more process and we'll see what that does over the break yeah i was just curious about using pocket size um so that's it's a random image with zero content weight to initialize it, and then mm -hmm. once you're looping it through, you're taking the last image, and is it like just the standard content weight on that, or like how does that? I, I'm using content weight zero, so there's no content reconstruction. It's just just so style. So I mean, but you like to achieve the continuity. There's no. Yeah, because the thing is, when you start with the in, init image, you're kind of forcing it to, you know, like if it's trying to learn Hokusai features on top of the on, on the image that was produced doing the same thing it's not going to change that too much okay. because it's already kind of there um so the, this is all just like the same process run over and over again yeah, yeah. on the last frame yeah okay. yeah mm -hmm. rotate a little bit it, it, because if you don't do anything to it then it w then then all you're doing is just continuing to add more iterations um so it'll it'll eventually converge and it won't do anything but if you rotate it you change the pixels slightly and it gives it enough yeah. you know change and to does it, because it does like one full rotation basically um it uh i don't know how many rotations it does it just does forever i yeah. mean i mean i'm asking like you end up in the same uh, frame as you started right? yeah but there's more to that and and probably not worth getting in that's that's already beginning to get specialized for for the tutorial yeah have you seen the uh Oh yeah, together. I yeah. didn't see that no, but that sounds really cool. I think could you do something similar with that? Like you're taking like a like choppy like frame rate, like slow motion video, and then like it like having to figure out just what numbers you need. Maybe, no, I don't know. Uh, I mean, kind of like there's a better way of doing that, but we'll get into that in generative models. Okay. Yeah, let me just finish the discussion of this because we would probably want to take a break soon. Uh, no, oh, no, okay. Um, optimizer, don't worry about, like, just use the LBF, FGS. Technically, like, if you use Atom, which is another one, it uses a lot less memory, but, um, but it may produce not as good results. Um, uh, because it uses less memory, you can make a lot bigger images, but you may have to mess a lot with the other, like, the learning rate and the other parameters, because uh, you might get bad results otherwise. Um, you probably don't need to, yeah, this is only important if you, um, uh, if you use, uh, I don't actually understand this because I thought I, I, Adam set its own learning rate. Maybe the initial learn, learning rate. Anyway, um, normalized gradient. This doesn't seem to change anything for as far as I could tell. Um, but, but you know, it's something to experiment with. Then uh, again, like a lot of there's just a lot of stuff. Like it's probably not something necessarily um, that that you'll end up playing with. Now, another cool thing about this is that, and the reason why I really like this is that neural style is also set up to use multiple GPU. Now that doesn't matter be, uh, for paper space because you only get one GPU in those instances. But in theory, if you have a, like a machine with two GPUs or three GPUs or four, you can um, actually use the multiple GPU functionality and that lets you get even, even bigger canvases than 1300 pixels. So I've been able to get like, I actually like they have an example of this so this is one that they produced with four GPUs, um, which is really big. It's like, it's Starry Night on top of an image of Stanford, which is where he, he went to grad school. And it's like, you know, I don't know how big this is, really big. 3620. So, so that's great, right? Beautiful, right? It's like almost... 
long. It takes really long. Now it takes now it takes like like probably to make this probably it took like on the order of hours. Maybe probably like it took like two hours or something to make. I would say, and also like it, they probably they used a. Again, like getting there's there's a lot you could do with this. It's like a really really um, they could they did it multiple resolutions and then kept blowing it up. Yeah. How many GPUs does each PC have? I don't know what they have in total, but but you can um, in theory get uh, four of some of them in one job, um, and even eight for w one of them. I think uh, I haven't tried with eight though, um, but yeah, I usually use four to get style again trained. Um, so when you're using more GPUs, it wouldn't necessarily speed up. Like if you're if you use the same resolution but spread across more GPUs, would it speed it up? If you sorry, if you use the same resolution across like, like, oh. obviously more because of the memory, yeah. the GPUs let you use larger canvases. Yeah. But if, you have, if you have the same canvas size you use if you have a canvas size that fits in one GPU and you use multiple GPUs uh n no that won't make any sense that then it'll actually go slower because oh, okay. um it has to communicate between the gpus yeah the best way to use the gpus is to do multiple jobs at the same time so you could have one gpu to get dedicated to each job so then you could produce four images at the same time or you could use them to get a bigger canvas and the way it works is that it divides the layer like it has these activations and the activations are spread across layers and so you can divide the layers like into each GPU and then um, so that lets you use each one, use less memory with each one uh, but then they do have to you know one GPU has to communicate with the next one and then so it does slow it down a little bit but um, the, the, the upside is that you get much bigger results let's see how this is going we're, we're still 500 so you can see it's really slow but the, the thing about um, it's a little bit asymptotic so like the the results are kind of more or less done around 500 uh, iterations. You can even stop there. Uh, between 500 and 1,000, it'll like kind of just refine it a little bit. But this is roughly going to be what we're looking at. So isn't that cool? Now, if we if we run this until a thousand, it's not going to look too different. It'll kind of maybe like smooth out the grays and stuff. It'll it'll look better, but but it's mostly refining it. Let's do one more thing that we'll take a break for. Let's do a texture synthesis. So let's let's what's a what's a what's a texture that we want to synthesize? Someone call it out. Hair. Texture like Hair. Material? <laughs> Fur. Fur. Well, Anything, anything, anything we want to do textures you know, like for. An example of one is like the Google Maps texture. Yeah, and I've already done that, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna punt that one. Yeah, we need a good example. Take a picture of that one. We could do that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm going to send that to myself again. Now, where is it? Oh, I have to actually compose the email. Right. Okay. Now, let's just pause that again. So, just so we know, we just, we took a picture of the blackboard and now we're going to do a texture synthesis um, first of all this is this is only 700 iterations so it's not even done but we can look at the final result I mean not the final result but where we are right now and then we'll just kind of stop it not get not bad yeah it's pretty good so let's quit this and make sure there's nothing running now we'll see that the board thing is here so now I'm going to do th neural style that Lua backend cudnn we do need a content image, and what we might as well, if we want it to be the same size, we could use board again, and we can use style image of board.jpg, and we'll do um, 
Uh, and and what else do we do? Image size. Let's do 1280 just to be safe. And the last thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to set content weight to zero. So now we're going to get a texture synthesis. So it should look pretty cool. Um, so let's go ahead and, um, oh, you know what? I'll take the opportunity to do one other thing and I'll show you how to run something in the background. So one thing that's really annoying is if you get disconnected, your process quits because you're running an SSH terminal. So the thing gets just hung up. So instead, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to copy that. And now I'm going to do the, I'm going to make a script. You can do this. You can say echo, which says echo means write to the terminal. All of this that we were going to do, write, write, uh, carrot or whatever, um, to run style.sh. So now if you look at, you see this run style.sh, uh, wait, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not echo, yeah, sorry. Um, cat. Cat Roof. No, 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 you're. No, it, it is. It, I think it is this, yeah? Wait, am I? I'm, I'm going the crazy. The echo is correct. The echo, the echo put it in the file, but then you echoed the file name instead of. Instead of. Yeah, do that, and then cat. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm losing my mind. Um, yeah, cat run style. Yes, okay, good. So now we, you can run the process in the background so that it you can, you can background the process using a command that I use all the time called nohop. So first of all, to run the command, you, you could do sh run style that sh. So then, then it would run it as normal, but we're going to do this in front of it. You put nohop which means no hang up, and then write, write, and then to some log file. So we say log.txt, and then an ampersand. I know it seems like a lot of like random minute details, but you do, I do these all the time. And so you kind of just like get used to it. Um, now, if I run this, it actually starts doing it. And it looks like I'm just back in the terminal. But um, if you look in log.txt, you see that it's actually now doing the thing that I was doing before. And let's just make sure it doesn't crash. So I'm just checking. Another way of checking to make sure it doesn't crash, we can check to see that something's running. You can see that it's running on paper space. Oh, sorry, uh, Lua, uh, tor Torch is running. Okay, so we can check the log again, and it seems like it's fine. So, okay, so what I'm going to do now is let's, let's, uh, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll see how our texture synthesis is going. And then we'll start the uh, intro and generative... Uh, General models, and I'm gonna hustle out of here. Um, so, <laughs> hey, you have a question? Yeah. This. Remember, I'm recording this, oh, so okay. so you'll you'll be able to. Yeah. Is, is Nohub just like available in like most shells? I think so. Yeah. I just yeah, yeah. knowing about that. Like, I think there's even better ways of doing it than I'm doing. No hop seems to be like I don't know, okay. maybe a hacky way of doing it, but it seems to work. Okay. All right. So let's. Okay. So, just for the sake of keeping every because we lost the recording, so this was the texture synthesis that we had. We you know wasn't wasn't as nice as we would have imagined it, but but you know, can't win them all. Anyway, uh, what was the question? Did you, uh, somebody. Oh, um, oh yeah. Yeah, that was like basically this. Um, yeah. Um, and back then, I didn't even realize to do the init frame thing. I actually totally missed that, and I, every image was made from random. And the way that I tried to give it some consistency would be by by uh, blending it. If I had done it with the frame by frame approach, that would have been much smarter. Uh, but but like I hadn't thought of that. And that now, my idea. dear, as you were saying. No, 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 you, no, no, no of course not. Uh, you can program that, right? That can be programmed. So you can, that can be programmed, it's very programmable. Yeah, yeah, so this is all programmed.
Anyway, um, so before I kill the paper spaces, any other questions about paper space? So again, like you'll have this recording, the tutorial for how to, you know, how to how to kind of work with these. Yeah. No, that was that was something that I made up. Like basically, it's not even a good idea. Um, <laughs> like you can see that it works. Like it worked a little bit, but not as. Like what I would do is I would take the content image and I would blend a little bit of the previous output into the content image and then run run it off of that. Mm -hmm. But that's not as good as, as using a proper init image instead and leaving a content image on the chain. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. Um, all right, well... Um, Again, like, uh, oh, oh, another thing, oh, this came to my attention because one person tried this and it didn't work. I forgot one other instruction in setting these, these up is that um, once you have run the fix.sh script, right? Um, so, yeah. Once you've run this, like, let's say you finished your, your install, your, there's that fix.sh and then it finishes. Then you need to do either restart the terminal or run the following source tilde slash dot bash rc now what is this doing why why i'll explain that in a second but if you do this then everything will work fine um i in fact i should really um put this into the just so you have it basically after after the so after um the bash script finishes you need to either restart the terminal or run source bash rc to refresh the path so the terminal can find your terminal can find your new torch because basically torch is a program it's installed somewhere and then in bash rc is this file which basically tells the computer Every time you start, run all these commands, and one of the things that it does is it sets your path. And the path says, where should the terminal look for programs, programs like TH. Um, and so after you finish that script, it actually doesn't um, overwrite it for you. And so, and so you, you just need to run this, and then it'll, it'll do it for you, basically. Um, so that's, that's there. So just run that because otherwise you'll run th neural style and it'll go th not found. Did you mean to install th? And then it'll give you some options for installing it. And you already did install it. You, it just doesn't know where it is. And so you just need to run source. So mostly little tiny terminal things that you really sort of get used to managing them. Okay, so... Um, Let's now go ahead and switch gears. I'm going to destroy these machines. Sounds really like, yeah, nefarious, but I'm just destroying <laughs> machines and now destroy, destroy ITP. <laughs> Remove public IP, deactivate. Oh. Yes, okay, now these are gone. Now, by the way, and just so, just if anyone ends up using paper space, be careful, if you forget to turn off a machine, They'll just bill you hourly for it, you know. So um, I've definitely had a few, you know, like overnighters that I've forgotten and, you know, lose like 10 bucks here, 20 bucks there. I feel like I've lost like probably like $200 over the years just from that. There, there is somebody that posted on their list that they lost like over $1,000 because they left it on there. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a while ago. I remember seeing it on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, okay, one of my students earlier accidentally committed uh, into a github commit accidentally put his amazon uh, cloud credentials on github somebody snatched that up and um, started you know mining bitcoin or something with his <laughs> with his amazon account and racked up like a twenty thousand dollar bill or something like that yeah. and so um they were able to resolve that with amazon does have some forgiveness for people who can demonstrate that that you know 
like their their account was hacked even though it was really stupid um, but um, so they didn't have to pay it but it was definitely a, I'm sure people experience get after stuff like that you, you know, yeah, totally. Warn you of that now, because I did that once by accident, and then immediately the school was just next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. I think uh, be, because yeah, at some point I think you could just search get you could just search GitHub with its own search function for it. <laughs> you know, like look for API key equals, and like you know, it searches all the code, like so <laughs> API key equals, and then you know, um, so yeah, definitely, definitely be careful with that stuff. Uh, and then actually, like even if you find it, you have to delete the repository basically because remember, like commit history means that it's all, it's all in there. So, um, yeah, definitely be careful with that stuff. Um, yeah. So, um, paper space is done. Public IPs should be empty. Also, it does share. It does charge you like a dollar per month for each public IP. So you want to get rid of those as well. Okay. Um, now I'm going to get back to the slides. So we don't have, um, we're not going to get too deep into it. I just wanted to give you like a, a short introduction into generative models and then probably we, we'll see how much of these slides we get to. Like ideally we'll kind of get into, into, we'll start talking about GANs like as soon as we're done presentations next week. Depending on if we have time, like maybe the presentations will take all, you know, the entire class possibly, but, but we'll see. Um, so. The next major sort of unit for this class is going to be generative models. Now, what are generative models? And, and you know, we've been looking at style transfer and deep dream. Are those generative models? They sure look generative, right? So they're not generative models. Um, the reason is because they're not modeling anything, actually, um, for, for starters. They're like style transfer and deep dream are really this kind of this technique which uses a model for a sort of analytical purpose, but it doesn't model the style of the style image itself. It doesn't really model uh, the content, doesn't model anything. You don't, you, in fact, you don't train any neural network, right? That whole process did not involve training anything. Like we were using an already trained neural network, which was trained to do something different. Um, so, so a generative model, on the other hand, is a neural network uh, well, it doesn't have to be a neural network technically, but in our case, it will be a neural network uh, all the time. Um, it's a generative model is a something that basically um, actually produces images or sounds or text or whatever it's trained to do, and it produces uh, samples uh, uh, that look like they came from a particular data set, right? So um, you know, let's so, you know, as an example, like. Uh, a well, like okay, a generative model of faces, right? And that's kind of one, one that we'll we'll kind of look at today. Um, now you've seen lots of these. These have been you know all over the place. Like you know, generative model of faces, generative model of cars, generative model of cats. These are able to synthesize images that look like cats and cars and you know pizza and whatever. Um, now again, Deep Dream does that too, but it doesn't really do it exactly. Deep Dream just kind of generates texture that matches the features that uh, of a particular you know category right but a generative model tries to model the entire uh, the entire object and what it does is it kind of models the probability of every possible image let's say if we're doing it for images what a generative model is technically I think I have a slide for this do I no well yeah okay that's coming up I'll tell you what it is technically in a second um, but for now, I'll just tell you like why generative models, what's interesting about them? Why do we have generative models? Well, for one thing, generative models are, are very useful in practical circumstances. So they allow us to create content, right? The generative models can create content. They can create new cats and dogs and cars and pizza. Um, they can create visual content. They can create audio content. They can create text. They can, you know, language. They can, you know, create basically Anything that you can model can be created by a generative, uh, generative model. Um, language models in particular, like generative models of language, are your chatbots and your personal assistants and your automatic uh, summarization and your the duplexes that Google came out with a year or two ago, the ones that basically call up restaurants and make an order on your behalf and all this kind of stuff. Um, 
you know, your, your language models, right? That's, that's kind of what those do. They generate text. They're generative models of text. Um, you can think of a lot of interesting accessibility applications, right? Because one class of generative models, which we'll talk about more in, in, in two or three weeks, are these that generative models that go from one, uh, one type of domain into another domain. So a generative model, for example, that takes an image and generates text that describes that image. Yeah. So um, that could be useful for a lot of accessibility things, right? So, you know, you can create uh, applications which, let's say for a blind person, they might be able to tell them what's in front of them, you know, something like that. Um, there's uh, generative models are really important for reinforcement learning as well. Um, it, uh, at least reinforcement learning that has models in it. Reinforcement learning is something that we'll probably touch upon like late in this semester. Uh, but reinforcement learning is basically everything that involves training, training robots and training agents that play video games and training basically things that interact with their environments. And uh, for an agent to interact with its environment, it has to be able to, of, of sort of imagining possible futures, right? And you're, you have a generative model in your brain as well. So when you think like, uh, when you start to plan your day, you're kind of simulating every possible day that you might have in your, in your mind. You're, you're generating, you know, imagining basically days that never occurred. Um, so that's a generative model. Um, and uh, let's see. So like generative models are very useful for, um, you know, like, okay, this is really captured by the Richard Feynman quote. What I cannot create, I do not understand. So the implication is you, you may understand that which you, that, that which you are able to create. And by create, we mean model, right? Like model means create, like a model airplane. We created an airplane. Um, if we can create something, we have figured out its internal structures uh, such that we can, you know, make it, do the, make it do things. And so a generative model, for example, of the climate or a generative model of physics allows us to understand the climate or the world. So, um, and then generative models are just, you know, generative, right? We're into generative arts. We're into generative systems, so they're really great for music and art creation, right? Generate new songs, generate new paintings, generate new poems, and so on. Um, now, generative models, for example, for me, they're super interesting because they really allow us to, to go deep into the, to the minds of people. And, and I, I don't mean like individual people, but, like, but kind of like people as a, you know, <laughs> as a construct, right? Because... I have this this super pretentious um, idea slash article about about this because it's part of a project that I'm that I'm really interested in, and the idea is that you know generative models trained on large amounts of crowdsourced data from many many people are beginning to kind of approximate or model our collective psyche, our collective imagination our collective conscience, you know, our, our unconscious, right? Because, you know, a million people labeling a bunch of photos, this is a dog. If we model that um, and you model it over a million people, then individual eccentric eccentricities are smoothed out and you're, you're approximating something which is sort of common to all people. And so I'm really, really interested in this idea. Um, and it's kind of like something that I'm developing on top of, but that's for another lecture. Um, so yeah, woman eating a delicious sandwich, indeed. Now, okay, what are generative models? What are they technically? So imagine you have a collection of a million photos, a million photos of faces, right? And each of those photos have 100 pixels each or something like that, or 100, maybe 10,000 pixels each, right? 100 by 100, let's say. Then um, our generative model, the goal of the generative model is to model a 100 by 100 pixel image uh, and, and to basically give us a way of, tell, a, a way of calculating the probability that any combination of pixels which is that size, 100 by 100 pixels, uh, belongs, uh, it, well, any, the probability that such an image comes from that data set, right? Um, in other words, you have, if you have a million images of faces, right, and you make a generative model, and then you give it a new face, 
it should attach a high probability to that face being coming from the data set. Whereas if you give it random pixels, it should attach a low probability of giving you of, of being from that data set. So it's a probabilistic model. It's a it's a it's a probability distribution. And then to create images from this generative model, we simply sample from that probability distribution. And to sample from a probability distribution means means to actually, you know, grab a set of pixels which is, you know, somewhat likely to occur. Um, something like that. And the and the way that it's typically at the highest level modeled or uh, constructed is as a neural network which is trained on a data set of many images. And the neural network, remember neural networks have inputs and outputs, right? So what is the input and output of a generative model? The input is random numbers basically. Um, now they're not random exactly. We'll describe later, like next week or in two weeks, what exactly the nature of these random numbers are. But for now you can basically think of them as, as, as random. Sometimes you'll hear, for example, latent input or latent vector, uh, latent observation, latent feature vector, something like that. Um, latent, a lot of latent. Um, and uh, latent space, as you might hear. Uh, and this, this is a reference to this random number, right? Um, or it's a random vector, rather. Uh, very often it's a, a random Gaussian, basically, like a unit that's like sampled from a Gaussian distribution, like a normal distribution, right? And what it outputs is an image, right? If it's trained on images, of course. If it's trained on sounds, then it outputs sound. If it's trained on text, then it outputs text. So, um, so this is basically the, from the highest level, all generative models can, can, can roughly be approximated this way. Not, not necessarily, not, uh, some, some have some caveats, but something like this basically um, is roughly what we're talking about. Now, um, yeah, well, and, and so like I said, like the, and this is maybe just getting a little too mathy, but the idea of a generative model is that we're learning a probability distribution like the probability that any set of, of points actually, um, or, or uh, that uh, an arbitrary set of points, we're learning what the probability of any arbitrary set, are, of our, any arbitrary sample belonging to that model. So like, let's say you have a distribution of points, you know, and there, there are these dots here, then we can kind of like create a model whose distribution roughly approximates this, you know, so, so everywhere there's not too many images it has low probability and then the general model is roughly trying to approximate it so that we can sample from it right so this is kind of like the open ai has a nice um has a nice blog post about this actually which i would read um and um now the, now one way of beginning to understand generative models is to try to construct a very 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 simple one um because Neural networks, you know, autoencoders and GANs and all of these, they are pretty sophisticated generative models, but they're not actually ultimately all that different from very simple ones. Um, they have a few tricks to them, uh, but if you understand a very simple one, you kind of understand the, 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 the idea in its sort of abstract. Now, uh, let me just see, like, we're, it's 5.50, and let's see, like, how, how long, uh, I want to quickly evaluate just how long this PCA will take me to do. I think what we can do is describe PCA and then we'll, we'll yeah, and then we'll, we'll call it. So this will be just a very quick introduction to PCA and, and then we'll just, we'll quit at six basically. Um, okay, and then we'll, we'll get into actual neural networks next week or two weeks from now. So, okay, principal component analysis is PCA. How many people have heard of, I think I've probably even mentioned PCA at some point in this class, right? Principal component analysis. How many people here have some grasp of PCA, like what it is? Normally you don't hear of PCA in the context of a generative model uh, because it's generally not used as a generative model. And the reason it's not generally used as generative models, it's not a particularly very good one. Um, so it's not good at generative modeling, but um, it is actually like pretty, it's, the, it's very simple form of generative model. Um, I should say it's much simpler than, than a neural network one, but, um, uh, but, it, but it has like all of the features that we kind of want, want to, you know, want to show. So um, 
first of all, let's just describe what PCA is, right? And we and maybe did I have slides about this before? I can't remember. I don't think so. Yeah. Did I show these slides? No. Yeah, Someone. Sorry. Maybe you you saw them on on the video, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I did show that, right? Yeah. yeah, I okay, so these this might be a little review. That's good. Yeah, I was trying to remember. So so okay, so imagine imagine you have a bunch of points on in uh to you have a scatter plot of points, right? Now, um remember these points like they're data points, right? Now they they seem really boring, right? But like think of it this way, an image is nothing more than this except not in 2D but in many dimensions, right? So if you have a, an image, a data set of images, which are all, let's just say 32 by 32 pixels, then you can think of any given image as being a point in a 32 by 32 um, dimension space. So 32, 32x32, 32 and actually it's color, let's say, so it's times three, 3072 dimensional space. And every, Point, every, a point is a, is a combination of pixels. And so a particular image is just a point in that space. So this is also just a point in, um, in a 2D space. And so this point can correspond to something that we have two numbers to describe. Let's say height and weight. You know, maybe this is a, maybe this, mean, this is height and this is weight. And you know, height and weight are positively correlated roughly, right? Um, so, um, now the idea, and, and height and weight is a good example of this, attributes, statistics about things, are not usually linearly independent. They're, they're not usually independent in the sense that, they're, uh, that they have no correlation with each other. And that's kind of what, math, what, that, what independence means mathematically, means uncorrelated. That's kind of like the mathematical definition of, of independent. Now, um, most things that you can observe about, thi about things are usually correlated with each other. Um, height and weight are correlated, right? Um, maybe house uh, size and house price. You know, they're correlated. Now they might not, not exactly, but you know, there's enough of a correlation there. And if there's a high correlation, then maybe what you can do is you can reduce the amount of information uh, by by kind of making some simplifying assumptions, right? So like we kind of do this with the word big, right? Um, you know, maybe a big person has has high height and high weight, you know, because there's like you can kind of like, uh, you know, um, well, maybe this isn't the mo this isn't the best like example. Like uh, maybe we'll say valuable house. A valuable house is one that probably is both big and um, and costly, right? So you can usually you can often collapse attributes into into smaller attributes which kind of encapsulate all of the attributes underlying them. So how would you do this? Well, in this scatter plot here, you can observe that there's really, really there's like a line that goes through these, right? And if you take that line, if you, if you find that line, and then you take all of the points and you project them onto the line, you flatten them, you kind of collapse them onto the line, and then you take that line with all the points on them, and that becomes a new representation, which is this, like these, have all been collapsed onto a line, and then we took that line out of there, we rotated it, and it became like an x-axis, and now we have a one-dimensional representation of the same data set. And uh, at the cost of having corrupted it, right? we corrupted it by projecting these points down, so now the distances between them are not exactly the same as they were before, but they're pretty close, like we didn't have to corrupt it that much. And so this is what uh, this is actually principal component. Well, we just showed this principal component analysis. Principal components are the vectors that sort of characterize where the 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 um, where the, the the sort of axes upon which the data is best distributed, right? Like um, you know, so um, in this, there's one principal component, which is this vector right here, and then the principal component analysis means we find those we find them. And then once we have the principal components, we can actually do a lot of things with them. But one thing we can do is get rid of the, the principal components, which have very little variance, right? So here there would be actually two principal components. There would be this one, and there would be the one that's parallel to, uh, that's uh, perpendicular to it. But the one that's perpendicular to it has much less variance along it, 
than this one. And so we just discard it. We remove the one that has less variance and we just keep the, the bigger variance one, right? So that's what principal component analysis is. It's a way of projecting data um, into a lower dimensional space such that it preserves its integrity roughly. Uh, and the way we do that is by, re by finding a new representation of it and getting rid of the, the, the uh, axes which capture very little variance. Um, something like that, right? So in 3D, this would look like this, right? Imagine we have a collection of points in a three-dimensional space. And if you look at them, it all seems like those points actually lie very close to a plane in that space. So again, it's like we can, we can identify that plane. And the plane is character. There's, there's three principal components now, which are mutually orthogonal to each other. That means they're all mutually perpendicular. It's like a new axis, new axes. Um, and then we... Uh, remove the one that has the least amount of variance and then we're left with this two-dimensional representation all of the points have been projected down into that two-dimensional representation at the cost of some corruption and uh, we have this new representation which has some advantages the advantages are that it's very densely sampled so there's not very much empty space here compared to here look how much empty space there is over here there's just nothing there so we're getting rid of empty space we're making a dense you know, kind of like in this visual right here, it's like we're getting rid of empty space or roughly empty space. Um, now, the way principal component, principal component analysis, we're not going to talk about how it's actually calculated. That's something for, you know, you can look up and see the algorithms for it. They're actually, it's just straightforward linear algebra. But the important thing is that the um, actual uh, computation can be represented as a matrix, right? So here, the original data is X, and there is some, some matrix, W, which when we multiply by X, gives us a new representation of the data, uh, w uh, which we can call T, which is the same data, except in, uh, uh, as described along these different axes. It's like we shifted the axes, basically. And, um, and then we can remove the columns of T, and basically give you know, as many as we want, and then we give, get a smaller version of this. Now, the important thing to note is that this process, like other, like, you know, you can invert it, right? You can say, well, um, if you take the inverse matrix of W, move it to the other side, we can get a way of reconstructing X from the original T, right? So we can take, we can go from this to this and then go back again from this to this. And um, now because we've corrupted the, the original data points, they won't be in the same place anymore as they were in the original data set. And so there's some corruption there, but um, but it's roughly uh, you know roughly uh, roughly in the same place. So there's no going back. Well, uh, n n n unless you keep all the principal unless you keep all of them, yeah. uh, but if you discard them, then yeah, then there's no going back. It's like compression. There's a way of doing compression. You can do image compression with PCA. Um, now PCA is not a very good form of image compression compared to JPEG, but um, but you can do it that way. So um, an image, so you can think of any image as being a point in pixel space, right? You know, if you have three pixels and they're grayscale, let's say that it's like one point here is as a combination of those three pixels. Now the uh, now three pixel image that means there's this many possible images, a lot, right? If, if 255 to the raised to the third power, that's a lot, right? So now just imagine if you have a thousand uh, a thousand pixels, 255 to the thousandth power means that the number of possible images that you can describe with a thousand pixels is bigger than is bigger than any number you can imagine right it's like um so here's an example right if, it, if we're talking about faces or pixel uh, pictures that are 32 by 32 pixels and are color then we have or, or let's say grayscale in this case no this color 255 to the 3n so 255 to the 3072 right or, which is roughly two to the eight thousandth power i mean it's just some unimaginable number this the number of possible 32 pixel images that you can 32 by 32 pixel images that you can create is astronomical so modeling them is really important because there's a lot of empty space out there and so we just have to kind of like get rid of it so yeah this is this is what's called the curse of dimensionality the more dimensions you have in your data the exponentially more empty space becomes right grains of sand and earth 10 to the 20th 
atoms in the universe 10 to the 80th number of 1024 by 1024 rgb images mm -hmm. is 10 to the 7 millionth or something like that yeah so really crazy <laughs> Um, I'm going to skip. I really like this stuff, but I talked about the, I, I think I mentioned this, the whole eggshell idea, right? This is actually the eggshell slide. So uh, the volume of a hypersphere in many, many dimensions, almost all of the volume is inside the shell. So it's just kind of like one of those weird math things that um, people like me are really into. Um, okay, question. Which of these images are most and least alike? It's a trick question. <laughs> the answer is they're all unlike from each other by a, by the same amount, right? <laughs> These two images, even though they look like random noise, to you, like I'll say, are, is this more alike uh, with this, or is this more alike with this? And you you might go, well, these are more alike because they're both random noise, right? But the thing is, every random noise is different from each other by the same amount that they're different from stuff that's not random noise. Um, the point is that random noise is junk. That's the whole point of this slide. Yeah? So, um, I'm just thinking from another kind of aspect. If you're thinking about those four random noise as a kind of style, like, is there any way that we can um, transition to think about this kind of thing as a style, then compare that with this one? Uh, what, what do you mean by think as a style? Not um, really sure what you mean. Okay. It's very... You can train a style transfer on on this if you'd like. Um, not necessarily like a tra um, style transfer that will merge into like a style detection or a second style as a way to determine the similarity between images. Um, the I'm still not sure I understand what you mean. I mean, you like a neural network that has that's looking for features. Um, can be used to determine the similarity of two things, like it, it you know, it, it, their styles, like it is in style transfer. Um, but, but yeah, it's yeah. I think maybe something that is like we have a concept that those are all. When when you say alike, you literally mean like distance. Yeah, yeah, distance. in higher dimensional space. Yeah, and those are all the same distance. So yeah. the, the the noise ones are like in that they're all noise, but that's a feature that's not yeah in like the distance itself. So until you do some kind of learning, like if you just look at this map, they're mathematically just as close as this. Right. Um, okay, so I'm actually, I'm out of time. So we're going to punt the, uh, the, PC, the actual PCA for faces to the next class. And we're actually, we're pretty close to where, where I wanted to be. I wanted to basically get to the, to autoencoders and then this will just tack on another like 10 15 minutes to what we have okay um so uh as a reminder uh next time we meet we're gonna have these presentations please email me if you want to you could show me something that you just literally you could you could send me the project itself if you just have media to show you can um uh, you can meet with me at office hours, let's say. So you could do this. You could submit it, let's say, the Wednesday after this, which would be, um, oh, no, that, that would be the 23rd, right? So you could you could show this to me on office hours on the 23rd um, or present it in class, and which is optional, and you have these. And then after we're done presentations, we're going to start talking about GANs and stuff, and um, that's going to be really fun. And we'll finish the rest of this lecture as well. Um, it, depending on how long it takes, that that will probably take us into the following week as well, because there's there's you know we're only gonna have potentially only half a class, but um, but but yeah that's roughly the next segment. Any any questions? Okay, okay so I'm going to um, I'm gonna hustle the hell out of here, and I'm going to be. I'll be a little delayed in putting the lecture online. Obviously, I'm going to be on the plane for a little while, so um, so I'm going to try to get this this in the slides up as soon as I can. And uh, in the meantime, like feel free to if you have questions over these next two weeks, like please email me and let me know what you're thinking to do. If you have some questions, uh, if you if you're struggling with anything complicated, like let me know. We should be able to figure out a way to to kind of tackle that somehow um, with the technologies that we have. That's, Okay, cool. All right, see you guys. Uh, see you guys in two weeks. Enjoy your. Well, you don't really have time off, but enjoy. <laughs> <it anyway. laughs> oh, yeah.